Welcome to the ECB, ladies and gentlemen, and to this public hearing on the draft addendum to the ECB guidance on, to banks on non-performing loans. I'm Connie Lotze of the ECB's communications department. So this hearing is being webcast live, and a transcript of it will be posted on our website later on. The consultation on the addendum, as you know, will end at midnight on December 8th, so you can still submit comments in writing as, as well then, until then. Let me introduce our speakers. Next to me is Danielle Nui, the chair of the ECB Supervisory Board. Next to her, Sharon Donnery, deputy governor in the Central Bank of Ireland and chair of the ECB's high-level group on NPLs. To Sharon's right is Anne Fröhling, ECB head of section and part of the team coordinating the work on NPL guidance. And last but not least, to the far right, is Sharon Finn, ECB advisor and a member of the NPL task force project team. Ms. Nui and Ms. Donnery will make introductory statements before we will turn to the floor to your questions and comments. Daniel, please. Thank you, Connie. Uh, good morning to all of you, or also I should say good afternoon. Uh, we are afternoon, indeed. It's a pleasure to welcome you to today's public hearing here at the ECB in Frankfurt. Uh, this event is part of a public consultation on the draft addendum to our guidance to banks on non-performing e exposures. As expected, there is a lot of interest in this hearing. Non-performing loans, NPLs for short, have become one of the most widely discussed issues in the European banking sector. This is not a surprise, considering the sheer volumes of NPLs, which reach around 1 trillion euro at this peak. As a banking supervisor, I welcome the fact that NPLs receive so much attention. After all, they do pose a major problem. First of all, they wait on the balance sheet of banks, curbing their profits. That's a problem, as European banks suffer from a lack of profitability anyway. Second, NPLs are distracting and represent a drain on resources. For instance, they absorb the time and energy of bank staff and management, who could be employed more usefully on tasks such as adapting their bank's business model to the fast-changing environment. Third, NPL undermine trust in a bank. How much trust would markets and investors have in a bank that is weighed down by high stocks of NPLs? In short, high levels of NPLs weaken a bank and keep it from doing its job. And that job is, broadly speaking, to finance the economy. As the president of the ECB stated at the ECB Forum on Banking Supervision on 7 November, I quote, internal ECB analysis shows that over recent years, banks with high stocks of NPLs have consistently lent less than banks with better credit quality, therefore providing less support to firms and households, end of quotation. So at the end of the day, NPLs are not just a problem for the affected banks, they are a problem for the entire economy. The good news is that some progress has already been made. Since 2015, the ratio of non-performing loans in the euro area has gone down from around 7.5% to around 5.5%. In absolute terms, this is a decrease of around 200 billion. However, that's just an average. There are parts of the banking sector where NPL stocks are still far too high. This issue uh, needs to be resolved. That has been one of our supervisory priority, uh, priorities right from the start. Our comprehensive assessment back in 2014 helped us to gauge the size of the problem. In 2015, we set up a high-level working group whose job was to devise a joint supervisory approach and the colleagues involved had done a great job. I thank them for that. They have developed an approach which is genuinely European. It aims to ensure a level playing field across the euro area. In March this year, we published our qualitative guidance to banks on non-performing loans. It sets out the way in which banks are encouraged to deal with non-performing loans. It should help them to draw up plans which are ambitious yet realistic on which are backed by uh, adequate governance structures. Using this guidance as a reference, our joint supervisory team have assessed the bank's plan. 
In short, we expect banks to deploy a diversified set of tools to reduce NPLs, such as cures, sales, and write-offs. We expect them to reduce the NPL steadily year by year. And we expect the envisaged level of provisioning to be in line with the underlying strategy, for example, with regard to the sales at current market prices. Reducing the high stocks of NPL is the first step. Banks must also ensure that the problem does not recur. And this forward-looking approach is supported by our draft addendum to the guidance. The draft addendum clarifies our supervisory expectations in respect to the provisioning of loans that become non-performing in the future. So to be very clear, we are not talking about existing NPLs here. We are not talking about the stocks. The main purpose of the draft addendum is to make our approach transparent. And I would like to mention something which has sometimes been misunderstood. Our expectations are firm, but there are no automatic actions attached to them. We will discuss provisioning with each affected bank. And we will duly consider the, co the clarification as well as the specific circumstances of each bank. If we are content with the clarification, then no further action will be proposed. However, if we are not convinced and believe that the bank's provisions do not adequately cover the credit risk, we may consider supervisory prudential measures under the Pillar 2 framework. The ECB plays an important role in resolving NPLs, and in doing so, we take an intrusive approach, but also a fair one. This consultation demonstrates that we are interested in listening to all stakeholders before we take action. However, we are not the only ones that can and should take action. What we need is a joint effort, which also involves the banks, regulators, and national governments, as well as European institutions. How easily NPLs can be resolved also depends on the national legal and judicial systems. On here, we see many differences between euro area countries. The time required to resolve NPLs in court, for instance, varies considerably. And in some countries, there are no specialized courts or judges to deal with insolvencies. In addition, faster out-of-court state settlements are not available as a tool in every country. All these slows down the resolution of NPL, and it could all be addressed by national government. Given that we live in a banking union, we should aim for a system which makes it just as easy to resolve an NPL in one country of the euro area as in any other. Thank you for your attention. And now I will hand over to Sharon Donnery, the chair of the high-level group on non-performing exposures. Uh, thank you, Danielle, and good afternoon, everyone. So direct engagement with the public through the consultation process and through our public hearing today allows us to listen and benefit from your insights and helps to promote trust. We welcome the comments already provided from the European Parliament and the Commission and the feedback we have received from some other relevant stakeholders so far. Some, I believe, have viewed the draft addendum in isolation. However, I think it's important to recall that what we are consulting upon today is a non-binding draft addendum to the qualitative guidance that we published on 20th of March. It's worth recalling that the qualitative guidance I refer to requires banks to, amongst other things, establish bank-specific strategies which lay out their individual approach and objectives for NPL management. In this context, significant institutions need to take into account the bank-specific operating environment, bank-specific internal NPL capabilities, and embedding their own bank-specific strategy into management processes. Without an appropriate governance structure and operational setup, banks will not be able to address their NPL issues in an efficient and sustainable way. And this matters regardless of whether we are talking about the stocks of NPLs or new NPLs as they emerge. Banks have the responsibility to ensure that they have adequate internal control mechanisms to promote sound and efficient risk management. And this means dealing with their stocks of NPLs in a deliberate and determined manner. It also means ensuring that they are prepared for any buildup of NPLs in the future, the issue that we are here to discuss today. Now the ECB, for its part in this context, as an intrusive supervisor, 
also has the responsibility to ensure banks have efficient provisioning methodologies and processes, which should ensure that their NPL-related risks are adequately covered. And we have the responsibility to set clear expectations to that effect. So the addendum reinforces the qualitative guidance and I think is the context in which it should be seen. More specifically, the addendum sets out in a clear and transparent way our supervisory expectations for prudential provisioning of new NPLs. The draft addendum outlines that fully unsecured NPLs will generally be expected to be fully provisioned after two years of vintage and full prudential provisioning should generally be expected after seven years for fully secured exposures. We have calibrated our expectations taking into account international best practice, the results of our stock take on national practices with regard to legal, judicial and extrajudicial elements and supervisory judgment. This is part of normal supervision. It's also important to note that the draft addendum is not in itself a pillar two measure but following supervisory dialogue and taking into account bank-specific circumstances, its implementation may result in individual Pillar 2 measures for certain banks. And the draft addendum provides an indication of what the ECB expects from banks when we conduct the assessment of the risks they are exposed to. The accounting position of a bank serves as a starting point for the supervisory dialogue in determining whether a bank has adequately covered, from a prudential perspective, its credit risk exposures. These and other CET1 adjustments are then compared with the supervisory expectations in the draft addendum. Banks are expected to discuss their approach to provisioning and collateral with respect to our supervisory expectations. The ECB will give due consideration to a bank's position compared with their expectations and in view of the specific circumstances of that bank. If through this process the ECB still considers that the bank's provisions do not adequately cover credit risk, a supervisory measure under the Pillar 2 framework may be considered. However, if the ECB is satisfied with the explanations, no further action is proposed. At the risk of oversimplification, it can therefore be viewed as a three-stage process. First, as a transparent supervisor, we have set out in a clear and consistent fashion our supervisory expectations. Second, we will undertake our analysis of the bank-specific circumstances, strategies, governance and operations, recognition, the accounting position and banks' comments in the supervisory dialogue and so on against these expectations. Third, these will be executed on a case-by-case -case basis and our results will be incorporated in the bank-specific SHREP decisions. Because working out NPLs requires concerted action by many stakeholders, it's important to note that we welcome work being done in other fora, including the ECOFIN Action Plan. As previously mentioned, our work will not stop here and we will bring further, further proposals to deal with the stocks of NPLs in Q1 2018. However, today is about the draft addendum which we have published and we welcome your questions on this item. Thank you for your attention. Thank you both. So we'll come to your questions and comments now. Um, we have microphones here that we would um, direct to you when you raise your uh, hands and we would uh, ask you please to state your name and affiliation. So please in the front here. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madame Donnery and Madame Louis. Uh, Eric Lutzi, Managing Director with KPMG. Uh, as you know, one of the questions that banks uh, um, might have is uh, about the operational complexity of the supervisory expectations. So will the, uh, will the expectations um, be, be targeting the specific exposure in terms of report, reporting or more at the portfolio level? Thank you. Well, let me start uh, responding that the, the, the complexity is uh, not uh, that big uh, because uh, what uh, the ECOFIN measures uh, uh, are recommending is a pillar one measure that will uh, take some time to be implemented. Uh, you could have mentioned IFRS 9 as well that will be implemented uh, in parallel but it will take some time to uh, 
uh, to be uh, fully uh, covering uh, the, 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 the portfolios. Obviously, if the ECOFIN uh, decides to go uh, to uh, pillar one measure, legislative measures, once it is uh, applicable and once uh, it is uh, addressing all the, the portfolios, we will adapt our own uh, measures. So regarding our measures, uh, they are the new uh, non-performing exposures which is indeed a difference with the ECOFIN, uh, which is targeting uh, new loans. Uh, but we think that uh, now is the moment to address uh, non-performing exposures, in particular because uh, we are uh, enjoying good economic conditions in the euro area. Uh, and if we uh, wait uh, until uh, there is a pillar one tax first and then it is covering only uh, new loans, uh, we have to keep in mind that the, the full rolling over of the existing uh, loan book uh, can take a decade. So uh, we, we have also to uh, address, in my view, the, the future NPLs until we have uh, measures that will be implemented on uh, uh, fully rolled over the, the, the whole portfolio. So there, there, there is a sequence and we are ready to adapt uh, our own uh, guidance once uh, there, there is uh, something else. But still, there will stay room for uh, pillar two. Uh, we have, uh, first of all, uh, the accounting provisions. Uh, the powers of the supervisors uh, start uh, when the accounting uh, provisions uh, are not uh, uh, sufficient. Uh, with IFRS 9, they are less likely to be insufficient because they, they will be covering also uh, expected losses. And if there is a pillar one tool one day, then uh, we will have uh, only a smaller remaining part uh, to address for sure. Maybe I'll just add briefly, um, so regardless of the addendum, even leaving aside the addendum and its application to new NPLs, um, I think in general we would expect banks of course to have policies, practices, procedures and so on for dealing with uh, their provisioning. And we would look at that through both a portfolio lens and a case-by-case -case individual uh, bank file lens, for example if we're doing on-site inspections where we would look at, at samples of files. Um, certainly, I think in terms of our expectations, we're saying that banks need to look at, at individual loans and see where they are against these expectations. But of course, we accept that there has to be a kind of practical way to implement that, and this will be part of what we would discuss with a bank. I think that's particularly important where we'd be discussing, for example, if it wasn't going to apply, the reasons why particular loans or particular portfolios of loans, for example, did, didn't require this uh, type of treatment. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Questions? Okay, why don't we start here in, this, in the third row, please. Good afternoon. My name is Sven Guckelberger from LBBW. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, in practical terms, what the, uh, when the vintage actually kicks in, i.e. once you have a, a loan uh, considered um, defaulted, um, it usually takes three months, six months, nine months, maybe 12 months until the whole process has been set up, everything is being... Um, done to so as to restructure a loan. Um, now, is that period of time already being considered um, um, the relevant period of time by when you would have to, to provision um, such a loan? And once it has been restructured, is there any sort of cure period you have to be aware of until you can put it back into the good bank or the, the good book, so to speak? Um, and the second question derived from the answer of the previous one, um, did I understand that correctly, that kind of given the IFRS 9 um, implementation being uh, just in, um, um, in a couple of weeks, um, would you consider that to be a double whammy kind of for the banks in terms of uh, stage two loans being considered in terms of LLPs or provisioning, uh, plus the, the intended um, provisioning under, under your um, addendum? Well, a lot of uh, good mm -hmm. questions in this one. I will start with certain elements and mm -hmm. I will uh, hand over to, to, to Sharon. Uh, first of all, you are uh, describing first a uh, process uh, which is uh, very much uh, statutory auditors and accounting process. 
and there is a separation between accounting and prudential. Uh, we are not uh, authorized the, the supervisors to uh, interfere with the, the work of, of the uh, accountants, statutory auditors, and also with uh, accounting rules, which can be quite uh, different uh, uh, in, in Europe because certain banks are using IFRS, but certain banks as well are using their own uh, national general accounting principles, meaning we can have uh, 20 uh, different accounting systems with their own vocabulary and their own uh, operational steps. So uh, uh, keeping that uh, as it is, uh, we uh, come after uh, the accounting provisions. Uh, the, the supervisory perspective comes after. Uh, and indeed, you are right, the supervisory uh, perspective now uh, will have to take into account that the accounting rules, at least for IFR, uh, the, the internal, uh, international accounting standards, has changed. We had uh, IAS 39, now we have uh, IFRS 9. So it means that when it is implemented, and it will take some time because the phasing in is a uh, pretty long, uh, uh, as it has been uh, decided. So when it is decided, uh, when we look at what we consider insufficient as provisions from a supervisory perspective, so totally different, uh, it's likely after IFRS that uh, it will be better covered the, by provisions, the credit risk, and we will inter interfere uh, later. Uh, so that's the, that's the sequence. And for us, we use uh, as a prudential uh, single definition of uh, non-performing exposures. Uh, this is the definition that, beans produ that has been produced by EBA, and it was a significant uh, step forward to have a single definition of non-performing exposures for uh, the, the, the entire uh, European uh, market. Uh, th that what, this is what permits to do uh, consistently the, the comprehensive assessment in 2014. So there are different ways of calling non-performing exposures, but what is the, 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 the good way is to use the EBA definition. So I start there, actually, with the EBA definition, because I think it has been a very important uh, piece of progress, and both the addendum and our earlier qualitative guidance uh, all operates on the basis of the EBA definition, both of NPE and also of CURE, so it's consistent uh, with those uh, definitions. Um, I think the issue that you raise in terms of timing is actually quite important and goes maybe to some of the other questions and commentary that there has been about the, guide, uh, the addendum. So the first thing is what is set out in the addendum in terms of timing is that uh, the proposal is that it would apply to new uh, non-performing exposures uh, from the 1st of January 2018. So this is a distinction between what is non-performing now and what is going to be newly non-performing. So really the scope is newly non-performing from the 1st of January. The question then is, well, how does that get implemented operationally? And exactly as you described, the bank has to go through a process of looking at that loan. Um, are they able to put a restructuring process in place? What is their own provisioning requirement for dealing with that loan? When would they apply that provisioning? How would they report that in their accounts and so on? And then over time, if that continues to persist, that that remains a non-performing exposure and it doesn't cure, then what we're saying is our expectation is if that's un uh, unsecured, then in two years' time, we would be wondering why is that not 100% uh, provisioned and if it was secured in seven years' time from the time it turns non-performing, um, why is it not yet provisioned at 100% and that would be what the dialogue is about. So when we talk about time, that's the timeline by which we're thinking about implementation. Now, of course, there's another question about when uh, after the public consultation, and I, I think Madame Nui has commented on this public al publicly already, we have to take in all of the comments, we have to consider all of the feedback and then we have to finalise the guidance. So so when it's actually published is another question about timing, but in terms of how it would work, uh, that's the way it would work. And then in relation to cure, then provided the EBA definition of cure uh, would be met, and we explain this in the guidance, then the vintage count or the, the count of the days of non-performing returns to zero, but it must be in the context of meeting the EBA definition of cure. Okay, next uh, question, the gentleman here in the fourth row, yes, in the middle. 
Thank you. Gregory Turnbull-Schwartz. I'm Fixed Income Fund Manager at Bailey Gifford. Um, I had two questions. One was just regarding the toolkit that the supervisor already has and whether it was felt that this aspect was missing or whether you could already have these conversations on a case-by-case -case basis in a non-binding manner um, you know, with, with, with everything as it stands today. Um, or whether it was felt that this was required in order to have that. And the second part would just be in terms of the publicity or otherwise, once you have identified an entity that's perhaps not living up to that standard, is it intended that there would be some sort of disclosure to the market of that, or is it going to be uh, kept on an off, you know, on a private basis? Thank you. Thank you. I take the first one and yeah. you take the second, Sharon. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the, the, the supervisors uh, are not overstepping uh, their, their mandate uh, in this. We uh, have the obligation to address uh, vulnerabilities in the banking sector and to guarantee uh, the consistent uh, application of regulation and supervisory policies. And that uh, includes uh, providing guidance that ensures uh, fair and equal uh, treatment uh, of banks, and in particular on an issue which is uh, as important as, as uh, delicate as uh, non-performing exposures. Uh, on the Commission, uh, in a, the recent report on the, the, the SSM, has explicitly encouraged us to take care of the necessary adjustment in case uh, accounting provisioning is not sufficient from a supervisory perspective. Uh, and it's uh, important because uh, there were uh, certain uh, institutions or people or banks that uh, uh, considered that the language was not uh, clear enough. So it has been very much clarified and we uh, consider that it is uh, very good. So now nobody can doubt that we have the possibility to take uh, what is called the pillar two measures, specific bank per bank, case by case measures. Uh, it is the, the supervisor's prerogative to impose requirements uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the risk profile of, of the bank, and that is complementing uh, requirements set uh, by lawmakers. So even after the adoption by uh, the legislators, for example, of a pillar one tool, and it's very good that uh, they take uh, the, the, the step of having also a pillar one uh, tool, so the, 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 the strong basis will be there when it is there, and we can uh, complement bank per bank for the, the prudential part that will obviously be uh, less important because uh, part of it has already been done by IFRS 9 and by the, the legislator for Pillar 1. Uh, so I would just add on the kind of missing, the idea of whether it was missing or not, I'm first to just echo what I said in my opening remarks, that for us I think this is about being transparent. And we do this for lots of other things. I mean, the ECB and many other supervisors publish often their expectations of all sorts of things. The ECB has other expectations around cyber risk, for example, um, and other risks. And in doing the addendum, that's and in fact our qualitative guidance earlier, I, I think we are trying to be transparent about what we expect to see. And that makes for a more informed supervisory dialogue because banks know already what to expect. And of course, the public and the markets know as well. So I think this is an important point. If you allow me, of course. Sharon, I will say that we have already published seven such documents uh, which uh, produce expectations from the supervisors. But some of them were uh, not so quantitative, so uh, were, um, but some were quantitative, like uh, the expectations regarding uh, dividend policies. So it's not something new, it's just that because of the issue it attracted more attention. Sorry yeah, no, for interrupting. No, problem. no exactly. Uh, and then on the disclosure point, um, so clearly as supervisor we have lots of confidential information and we would not be proposing that we would disclose this. Uh, but we had already in our qualitative guidance uh, some expectations set out there about further disclosures that banks should make. And one of the disclosures that's listed there is that banks should disclose um, vintages and provisions by vintages and so on. And this is also referred to in the addendum, but the disclosure would happen in this way. So the gentleman right here in the next row after behind, yes. Thank you. I'm Federico Cornelli from the Italian Banking Association. Um, we um, recognize the need to reduce MPS in all Europe, and we welcome the introduction of your guidelines on MPLs management on March 2017. And 
it is important for us the creation of a quasi-liquid private market for MPL, which we would like to maintain stable as much as possible. Uh, I have four questions, if I may. <clears throat> the first one regards the impact analysis. Uh, the better regulation principles foresees the impact analysis should be at the base of any proposal for new ruling and uh, providing estimated impact on the proposed regulation per se over the specific industry and more generally over the economic general cycle. And uh, to this extent, we wonder how the two years and the seven years timing have been computed. We understand that it was based on the on an international uh, benchmark. Also, we wondered if you have any estimation of the consequences of such ruling on credit pricing, credit supply, GDP growth, etc. And in, in our view, if you have any um, estimates on the impact on LGD calculation, uh, this would be uh, precious for us. And the second question is, again, the coordination between IFRS and tax and your prudential regulation. This proposed prudential regulation does not match with IFRS. In Italy, all banks use full IFRS and tax rules. Um, banks could easily find themselves in a situation in which IFRS and NPL addendum rules produce different computation, thus creating problems for financial communication and potential impact on price sensitive information, both for listed and non-listed banks. In particular, we have in mind the prospective, prospectus directive, the MAR regulation, and again, we wonder how this ruling could impact on minimum capital requirements on the branch of minimum distributable dividends and on the new MRL requirements. And uh, as far as the taxation is concerned, IFRS provisioning and prudential calendar provisioning do have different treatments, thus creating a tax distortion. Um, is there any chance to uh, avoid any problem, eh? just to find the solution? We are trying to, to find the solution to this. The first, the third question is that, uh, as Madame Nui said, uh, there are different experiences in civil course um, length in Europe. Uh, but the, it seems to us that the MPL addendum does not take into account the different traditions of judicial systems and especially different lengths of civil course. Those imposing are one size fits all. We are extremely in favor of a rapid, rapid convergence path in civil courts and bankruptcy codes. Uh, we, every day we ask for a European set of common codes. But until we reach such convergence, we should prudently take into account that there still exist differences. And the fourth question is, uh, we hope that this new NPL addendum will apply to new loans originating from the date of in the future. Also take into account the value of the guarantee connect, guarantees connected to NPEs. It is our opinion that the European Commission proposal could be a starting point for discussion, even to allow us to uh, correctly price new loans. Um, thanks for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, hopefully I can pick up uh, all the points. Uh, so maybe I go in reverse order first. Um, so in terms of the new loans, and I think you mentioned guarantees, we do have a, a, a way of considering uh, guarantees. And I think Madame Nui has already commented about uh, the uh, commission proposal and, and so on and how uh, both pillar one and pillar two measures may be needed and also the fact that if the commission introduced their proposal it would clearly take some time and so on and, and this is obviously required uh, or potentially required now. Um, in relation to your questions about the impact analysis and the, the court systems, I might take the two of those together because they, they do kind of interact a little bit. Um, so when we were considering the calibration of the two and the seven, uh, we looked at a number of, of different things. So we looked at um, similar requirements like supervisory expectations in other jurisdictions, including outside of Europe. 
We did look at um, exactly the point you make about the length of time it takes in judicial systems for collateral to be uh, executed and so on. And this part of our work was very much informed by our, our stock take of legal and judicial practices, which again we have already published in the interest of transparency. It was published earlier this year. Uh, so I certainly think we would uh, share some of the concerns you, you mentioned there about these differences and how um, the length of time particularly to execute collateral can vary uh, across uh, banking union and we have raised that publicly before. But we took that into consideration when we were calibrating uh, the seven years, particularly that in some countries it can take quite a length of time uh, to, to get collateral. And I think that we felt that seven years was a reasonable balance, taking into account all the, the different factors uh, of how long it might take to go through court. But also to say that if after seven years you haven't managed to restructure a loan, you haven't written it off under your existing policies and you haven't managed to execute the collateral, it's reasonable to ask the question, well, why is this not uh, fully provisioned? Uh, so, so that was uh, part of the analysis there. In relation to the more macro effects, I'm sure Danielle will want to comment on that, but I think uh, we see uh, that growth uh, has improved in the Eurozone over uh, consistently over uh, recent years. Uh, and I think we have a strong view that NPLs can cause uh, tremendous problems in terms of the ability of banks to lend and finance the economy and so we have to take the opportunity of these times of growth to deal with the issue and we can't allow it to persist. So I think from a macroeconomic point of view uh, this informed our assessment of, of how it would work. Uh, in relation to your comments around tax and disclosure and interaction with the prospectus and so on, um, I certainly think this is a, a useful thing to have been raised in the consultation and if you have specific suggestions and so on about how those kinds of things can interact, uh, we would certainly look at those to make sure that they're clarified in the addendum. Thank you very much, Sharon. I will try to pick up the remaining points. And if I miss one, feel free to, to ask me uh, to, the, the, the question afterwards. You mentioned uh, complexity uh, compared with uh, IFRS 9. Uh, well, first of all, uh, what has not changed is there is a block which is the work of the accountants, uh, statutory auditors, uh, about accounting rules and what is prudential. Uh, and it has always been uh, different, the, 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 the two blocks. On top of that, uh, there is a long and complex, I recognize, phasing in of uh, IFRS 9, which has been decided. The ECB was in favor of having the initial shock uh, to be phased in. But uh, not only this is phasing, but uh, the, the additional provisions uh, are phasing in, even where they caused by business uh, decisions that have been made uh, when IFRS 9 was already uh, applicable. So it will take a lot of time before the effects, full effects of uh, IFRS 9 uh, on uh, the solvency of the banks, for example, will be uh, taken into account. So the, the risk of complexity is almost non-existing, but in any case, it is uh, not materializing, even if a little before quite uh, some time. Regarding uh, the, the, the credit uh, delivered uh, in, in Italy, for example, because you, you mentioned, uh, you are from this country and mentioned uh, the point, I uh, checked this morning before coming to uh, this uh, discussion on the hearing, uh, and the uh, result, results uh, from uh, ECB uh, statistics uh, regarding Italy, third quarter of 2017, uh, are quite clear. They show uh, an increase of credits for both households and firms on a parallel move towards more accommodative uh, lending standards by banks and uh, households uh, on, on firms, towards households on firms. Uh, so uh, no such uh, risk uh, right now, on precisely uh, because the, the, the period uh, is the, 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 the right one to, to, to do this. And before the, the recovery in economic situation, uh, I was uh, told by the Italian banks that uh, I should wait until the growth was back. And precisely, growth has been back for, for some time now, and it's good to, to take the benefit of this good period of time. You mentioned differences in taxes. Oh, yes, that's, uh, that's absolutely correct, uh, but uh, it has always uh, exist, uh, and uh, this is not something that can uh, uh, stop uh, supervisory uh, Work. We have no power, no say in taxes, and that's very correct in my view, should not be the case. 
uh, and we are looking at risk, uh, and we appreciate risk and what has to be done uh, to, cover, uh, to cover risk. Uh, you mentioned uh, also the, the fact that the judicial systems are different and some are more efficient than others. That's a pity because in the banking union that should not be the case, it should, it should move. And in fact, uh, Sharon uh, and her team uh, have spent a lot of time to produce uh, uh, different 19 uh, stock take of the, the situation uh, uh, of the different countries, uh, best practices, uh, judicial systems, uh, and so on and so forth, precisely to, to make sure that the situation uh, would improve. And what uh, national uh, government should do? Uh, they, they should take measures to improve the efficiency of judicial systems. And some are, are doing, many are doing. And, and this is work in progress also in Italy, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, they should increase access to, to collateral and they should create uh, faster out-of-court uh, solutions. Uh, regarding the creation of a liquid market of distressed debt, yet that should, that should happen. Uh, should, uh, the magnitude of the problem is such that we need all tools that we can get uh, to be able to uh, adopt all kinds of solutions for these uh, non-performing exposures. And all initiatives uh, are welcome, obviously. Uh, improve data quality and access. That's very important because the, the prices uh, of the non-performing exposures, if they are sold uh, in liquid markets or European platform or whatever, depends very much to the, the, the quality of the data uh, that can be provided and precisely uh, the, the, the level of certainty of the recovery of the, the, the collateral. If there is uncertainty because of the judicial system, that is uh, preventing uh, the, the prices to, to, to go up. Uh, and obviously, they should uh, remove uh, tax on legal impediments to debt uh, restructuring uh, that exists in certain countries. But that we cannot do. Uh, Non-performing exposures is a problem that goes beyond supervision. And we need uh, the, the help of all uh, stakeholders. Uh. Any further questions? So the lady here in the front, please. Jacqueline Mills from the Association for Financial Markets in Europe. Um, I have three questions. I'll try and make them quick. I think two are perhaps a little bit more um, fundamental, philosophical, and one is a technical question. Um, the first question is about uh, the nature of the supervisory dialogue. Um, and I think that our, our members welcome the fact that you have given clarity on your expectations here. That's, you know, it's quite clear. You say it's nothing new, but it is a quantitative um, clarification, and, and that is helpful. Um, it's also very helpful that you've clarified that there is no automatic consequence um, and that there will be a supervisory dialogue um, and perhaps it would be useful to make sure that that is reflected in the final, in the wording of the final guidance. I, I wonder if you can, so this is my question, I wonder if you can say anything um, perhaps as to the, the, the supervisory, supervisory dialogue and its process. Um, I think that there might be a way to address at least the perceived burden of industry here um, um, and, and ensure that there is um, no confusion between accounting and prudential approaches. Um, so we understand that it's not your intention for there to be any, but to ensure that there really is the, a clear separation. Is there a reason why um, you would not, in, instead of using your expectation as the starting point, um, and then asking a bank to explain and justify um, why it might deviate. Is there a reason why you would not look at the accounting provisions and ask for justifications when you think they are necessary because the situation does not meet your expectations? So it's kind of difficult for me to explain, but I'm talking about trying to change a little bit the onus and um, the burden of proof, if you like. That's not the right word. but to put the onus on the, the, the supervisor, on the ECB, to challenge when the expectation is not met. So that the, the expectation really is a kind of backstop rather than a starting point to avoid the kind of confusion. So that's, that's one question. If you could talk us a little bit through the supervisory dialogue steps and, and why the, the reversal might be possible or not. Um, 
The second question is the elephant in the room. You mentioned um, in your introductory remarks that this was not the point of the discussion today. Um, but definitely there is a lot of interest um, in understanding whether there will be uh, similar measures or not uh, with, in relation to the stock. Um, as soon as information can be made available um, on the approach that would be adopted there, I think that would be very helpful and it would help communication and dialogue between uh, supervisors, the industry, and also all of the other stakeholders who are involved um, in, uh, in addressing this issue. Um, and then my third question, which is the technical one, is um, are you able to provide a little bit more clarity on the definition of exposure when it comes to, for example, off-balance sheet exposures and how those might be dealt with? Thank you. Thank you very much. I will take the supervisory part and uh, let the, the more uh, technical and also the possibility to add to the supervisory part if I forget something because uh, Sharon is, uh, is uh, and has a very strong background of uh, supervision as well. Uh, in fact, why to start with expectations? And I will use a concept that uh, Sharon has already put on the table and that I had not. Transparency. When undertaking a, a job of supervisors, we supervise 125 uh, banking groups comprised of 1,200 banks uh, in 19 countries. Uh, we need to, to have a methodology to benchmark uh, uh, so many different banks. So we need to have expectations. We need to have a, a discussion between supervisors on the decision at the supervisory board on what are the expectations. The, the, so that's why it is the, the, the starting point. Uh, I would like to give examples uh, on the couple of other issues that you have addressed. Uh, you say, why not uh, start with the accounting provision and uh, have the prudential on top? In fact, this is the way it works. And I will give you the example of the 2014 a comprehensive assessment. We uh, had an asset quality review, which was a part that precisely produced um, misvaluation of assets, uh, lack of provision sometimes of assets, and then there was a stress test conducted on the basis of the, the corrected valuation. In fact, what happened after the, the, the exercise. Uh, we had meetings with the statutory auditors of all the banks. Uh, we said that were, were in the comprehensive assessment. Uh, we said to these statutory auditors, this is what we consider as supervisor missing provisions. What are you taken into account in the uh, accounting provisions? Uh, if you take 50% of that, uh, we will take 50% on prudential side. If you take everything, we will take nothing on prudential side. So uh, there might be differences uh, depending on the accounting rules, which are quite diverse, as I already uh, mentioned. Uh, so if the, the, the work is done by the... Uh, the accountants' uh, accounting rules, uh, it's okay. But when it's not done, then we have uh, to address the, 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 the missing provision on the, the, the prudential side. So this is the, the way it works uh, still now. Uh, we look at what has been done by the auditors and accountants, and we uh, compare that with our expectations, and then bank per bank, because this is what it is, uh, prudential supervision on pillar two, it's bank per bank, case by case. Uh, regarding what is the supervisory dialogue exactly, I will give you uh, an example of supervisory dialogue uh, by uh, addressing the, the, the stock, precisely, the, the, the legacy uh, assets. Uh, we had the, the, the qualitative guideline that was defined by Sharon's group, and uh, we were uh, working on the expectation for the uh, steady state. But during this period of time, uh, in parallel to the consultation on the qualitative guidance, and in parallel to the work on the steady state, we had uh, this kind of supervisory dialogue uh, with the, the banks that are burdened by non-performing exposures. 
It means that following the, the completion and publication of the qualitative guidance uh, last March, uh, we uh, meet uh, with the significant banks that uh, were uh, burdened by this issue and ask them their own uh, non-performing exposure uh, plans. And over the, the period between March to June, the banks submitted their plans, their strategy uh, to um, address the, 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 the non-performing exposures. And the joint supervisory team, the GSTs, uh, met uh, bilaterally with each of these banks on the issue. And we are now in a process after one meeting or two or three meetings between the GST and the bank. So you see it's really case by case. We are in the process to send letters. GSTs will send letters uh, to the banks uh, assessing their strategy uh, based on uh, are they ambitious enough? Uh, related, obviously, to the, the, the quantity, the magnitude of the effort, how uh, realistic they are on the governance. So ambition, again, it's easy. Cross reduction volume, uh, uh, the bank is targeting. Uh, how realistic it is? Well, it depends. Uh, is it feasible? Uh, and it depends on the measures that will be used to reduce non-performing exposures. What are the tools? Cures, cash recoveries, write-offs, sales? Uh, how diversified those uh, measures are? Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, if you want to sell, uh, do you have enough provisions not to take losses or do you have enough capital to take some losses on top of the, the provision? So this is what is realistic. Uh, then we look at governance. Uh, if it is a big project for the bank, if it is ambitious, if it is an important issue for the bank, obviously uh, we expect uh, the banks to have performance incentives, uh, possible bonus, for example, for their uh, uh, staff uh, that are based on the reduction of the NPLs. So are they really uh, a good incentive? on uh, also the quality of the plan, a plan that is uh, pretty general and vague and that will land uh, in two or three years on no milestones, no, nothing me measurable uh, at each my milestone is not exactly a, a good plan. So you, you see the, the uh, supervisory dialogue is pretty intense. And this is what uh, we have done on the stock, this one. And we will do the same on the basis of the expectations for the future non-performing loans. And this is already uh, providing quite, uh, quite good uh, results. So uh, that's why uh, also uh, we, we are working on something for, for the stock. I don't know at all what this something will be because this is work in progress and uh, I have not seen uh, anything. But obviously, uh, the idea is to have, uh, uh, we have three, category, three categories of banks. There are banks that uh, decide, OK, uh, the, the supervisors are very serious about that. It's the moment to do a serious turnaround of the bank and to, 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 to have a kind of one-off cleaning uh, uh, capital issuance. You are, we have another uh, category which uh, take it seriously, uh, are a bit slower, but uh, uh, that will produce fruit uh, as well. And there are still uh, banks, nevertheless, that are in denial or send a vague plan, uh, lending in two or three years, but uh, without explaining how it will uh, be delivered, and that do not have the, the capacity of this ambition because uh, not uh, enough uh, provisions or so on and so forth. So we, we certainly want to push forward in this solution for the stock, the ones that are still in denial, and we don't want to uh, create uh, problems to the ones that are doing the right thing uh, at, uh, at a good uh, speed. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Danielle. Maybe I just add a few points. Um, so first of all, you talked about language and, and the redrafting and so on. So I would say again, um, in being transparent about our expectations, it's very important that people understand what they are. And if there have been misunderstandings, then obviously we have to address that. So that is exactly why we've had the consultation process and that is exactly why we'll have the hearing. Maybe to give you an example of that, 
We have been clear in the addendum, if you have it there with you, that this is non-binding. We also have a kind of diagram or figure uh, table in the addendum which says that there will be no supervisory measures if the, the dialogue delivers that the deviations are acceptable, and there will be if the dialogue delivers that the deviations are not acceptable. So for me, it's clear that it's not automatic. Having said that, I think words like comply and explain and so on have been interpreted as being automatic. So I hope we've been clear today that that is not the case, and we will certainly take that into account in the drafting. A further point on the dialogue, which I think uh, uh, Madam Nui has explained really, really well, including the examples she's given. I think it's sometimes thought that the dialogue begins one day and it ends another day and that's it. In fact, it's constant. It is going on all the time. So you talk about the burden of proof. I talk about challenging back a bank. The bank says something, I question that and vice versa. So it is genuinely an iterative process that continues a lot. And I think the strategies uh, for NPLs is a really, really good example of that. Clearly, we started with the comprehensive assessment. We didn't kind of not do anything else on NPLs in the meantime until we published the qualitative guidance. This was ongoing dialogue all the time. And uh, the work on the strategies is definitely very focused on that. Uh, the last thing I would say about the stock is clearly there is work is ongoing. And again, we have been transparent about that. I think, though, we have always tried to take into account the current situation. So we have gone step by step through the comprehensive assessment, through the qualitative guidance, through this addendum and quantitative guidance. We take into account what's going on in the wider economic environment. We take into account the situations of the individual banks. We take into account the progress that's being made or the progress that's not being made. And all of these different aspects will inform whatever that, uh, that further proposal is that we will make uh, in the uh, springtime. On the off-balance sheet uh, exposures, I think Anne was going to say a word or two, and then maybe Danielle wants to go back. Okay, so off balance sheet exposures are generally included because we use the EBA definition of NPE. And if you look into that definition, it does include off balance sheet. Now, 95% of NPEs are actually on balance sheet. If you look into our latest supervisory statistics, so the off balance sheet item on average is not um, a big deal. However, the coverage is relatively low. Again, in our statistics, you see it's only 14%. So it can indeed be a relevant item for a couple of banks. If you have ideas or certain things that you think we need to clarify in the addendum, please let us know. Otherwise, I would see it as part of the supervisory dialogue to address these, these very specific topics. I have no, no, no further. Them. Okay, then we go, uh, we'll continue the gentleman in the far, on the far right there, please. Yeah, thank you. My name is Ingmar Wulfert from the Association of German Banks. I have one question concerning the uh, scope of the addendum. Um, to my understanding, um, you mentioned in your um, guideline published in March that this guideline or several parts are primarily um, addressed to high NPL banks. So um, we would suggest that the addendum is also addressed primarily to high NPL banks because we think uh, with this addendum, uh, low NPL banks, they also have to implement the pr processes, etc. cetera, and um, these banks uh, would maybe be punished, in inverted commas, uh, by, uh, by implementing this addendum. So that would be our um, proposal to make it clear. Uh, maybe we were not uh, clear enough, but obviously uh, our expectations uh, are covering uh, uh, all uh, banks that we, we supervise. We uh, want to implement a level playing field on consistency. Obviously, it is of interest for the, the, the banks that are uh, uh, above a certain thresholds, above the, uh, the, the average, for example, of the, the ECB. But uh, SSM, uh, ECB, SSM banks. Uh, but uh, precisely, uh, certain countries uh, are not necessarily uh, very well equipped in their uh, legal framework because uh, NPLs have not been an issue for them uh, uh, recently and is not now. But this is the moment to change the judicial system for the moment where they might be uh, uh, concerned uh, and burdened by NPLs. It may happen. No country can consider that it uh, cannot happen to them. 
Uh, and we have also uh, another concept that was defined in our work uh, regarding uh, non-performing exposures. Uh, there, there are banks uh, that uh, are overburdened by the, 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 the global uh, av their, their, their percentage of uh, non-performing exposures compared to, to the other loans and assets. But uh, we uh, use the concept of pockets of non-performing exposures. They can be, uh, there can be banks that have a, a small uh, ratio of non-performing exposures, but still have, uh, can be shipping, can be uh, real estate, uh, can have one problem that they have uh, to fix. It's a less big problem because it's a pocket uh, of non-performing exposures in uh, uh, in portfolios of credit risk that are of good quality for the rest, but still it doesn't mean that they should not uh, address it. So uh, obviously uh, the, the supervisory dialogue is very intense with the banks that are currently burdened, but we want the other banks to be uh, properly equipped. We don't want to have a long phasing in for new uh, banks that would enter into uh, non-performing exposures. Everybody has to be ready. Any other questions? So let, let's take the gentleman and the lady there, and then we will move over here. Jörg Scharpe, Deutsche Bank, and thanks for taking my two questions. Actually, one would be a follow-up questions regarding the supervisory dialogue. Being, um, Can you a little bit elaborate on how you ensure within the supervisory dialogue uh, the consistency in the explain process, i.e., um, if in one discussion turns out a certain portfolio or a certain approach will be accepted as explain how this is ensured as in another firm the same assessment will be done and the second question is also a technical one uh, and maybe i've overread it somewhere but um in order to also encourage the the sales of non-performing loans amongst other banks um how are purchased credit impaired assets being treated under this rule. Um, so those are defaulted according to the definitions. Those have to be considered. Uh, is that something which we then have to take up in the explain process? Or is that something which can be per se excluded? Um, are there any ideas which you already have? Thanks. Thank you. I will start with the supervisory dialogue. Uh, how we obtain the, the consistency, uh, first of all, precisely by having expectations known, uh, and they are known uh, publicly for, for, for this, so it's uh, transparency uh, helps. Uh, also, because uh, the outcome of this supervisory dialogue is an, uh, an input into uh, the, what we call the SREP process, uh, supervisory uh, on review uh, process that uh, on an annual basis uh, delivers uh, the, the, the pillar two uh, capital uh, on other measures, other requirements and guidance. Uh, and also by the fact that uh, those decisions, the final uh, outcome of this uh, supervisory dialogue comes for decisions to the, the supervisory board uh, of the SSM. Uh, and our members are quite uh, cautious and uh, prudent and uh, uh, attached to the, the consistency precisely. Uh, it's not unusual when we have a, a new uh, development, a new point which is addressed, uh, or uh, something that has been addressed but not so often for everybody to, to remember, that uh, I am asked by my colleagues, uh, uh, prove me that uh, you, uh, and I want maybe this minute in the summary of the, the, this meeting, uh, prove me that you are ready to take the same measure uh, when uh, there is a bank that will be in the same situation. Obviously, it has to be the same situation because pillar two uh, on supervisory action is bank per bank. Uh, or prove me that you have already taken this measure uh, for a similar uh, bank before uh, in, the, in the same situation. So this is uh, something which is uh, uh, taken very, very seriously by, me by members. 
and also, uh, of course, by us, because this is uh, what, uh, what we want to do, to be fair in banking supervision. And to be fair, you have to treat banks uh, with consistency on, on fairness. And it's important because if you are not fair, you cannot be tough. And we need to be tough because we, we, there is no room for complacency. We are coming from uh, a very uh, uh, serious crisis. We have been built after a very serious crisis uh, to, to uh, make sure that uh, we are better equipped when there will be uh, another crisis. So consistency, uh, level playing field uh, is uh, taken very, very seriously. Explanation, well, this take play, takes place uh, in the dialogue between the, the, the banks uh, and the, their GSTs. This is the, the way it, uh, it starts. Uh, the, the visits uh, of the banks uh, voluntarily uh, to Frankfurt, or maybe the GST is uh, asking the banks to come with a certain periodicity on certain uh, uh, agendas, so in general is both uh, voluntarily plus the, uh, the program of uh, supervisory action uh, for, the, for the year. Uh, and uh, what I always uh, tell to, to the banks that I meet in particular when I go uh, visiting the 19 countries uh, of the, the SSM is that if you are not uh, fully satisfied by the explanations you have received from your uh, GST, escalate uh, the questions to the DG, pay a visit to the DG uh, in charge of this uh, GST. And if you are still not uh, comfortable with the response or fully convinced by the response that uh, or have not fully understood the response, uh, you can come and see me. I, will, I have ne never refused the meeting with a bank. And uh, in, in general, uh, I would say the banks understand what I have in mind and uh, what I am expecting them to do. Sometimes they will not like it, but uh, they will get a clear response. So I would just add to that that I suppose internally within the, the JSTs and the support structures that we have uh, to support the JSTs in doing their work, uh, kind of behind the, the published guidance and the expectations is a lot of material about benchmarking comparisons across portfolios, across banks, across countries. Uh, there is, um, uh, you know, processes where JSTs can get support from each other and, and other colleagues internally to compare and understand explanations and to make sure uh, that, that this kind of consistency and fairness is put in place. And that goes on as part of normal supervision, again, complementing uh, the supervisory dialogue. Um, in terms of sales, um, Anne might say a further word in a moment, but I mean, the intention is that there isn't some way for you to kind of arbitrage the system by selling uh, a portfolio from one bank to another. And if, if a, a new bank buys a portfolio of assets, then of course the same uh, expectations would apply. But in the same way, I think you even mentioned that this would also be part of the dialogue, but maybe you want to add something. Yeah, generally fully, fully in line with your comment. And I guess if you have the financial means and operational capabilities to buy NPL portfolios, you will have done a sound due diligence. And this is a very sound evidence for the supervisory dialogue. And if you can prove that the cash flows you had expected in the due diligence process are coming through, I think you really have a, a, strong, a strong case for, for an ex um, exception. OK, uh, the lady next to the gentleman who just asked a question had a question to, or a comment. My name is Sandra Hack, also Deutsche Bank, and I have two questions. Um, the overall idea of the NPL guideline, I understood that you want to manage non-performing loans better, um, but if banks need to provision their exposures, non-performing exposures, by 100% um, in a very short period of time, two years, even though clients might still recover, um, don't you see a risk for the real economy that banks might be more reluctant to lend in the first place to less profitable clients, to sub-investment grade clients. And then also when clients have become non or loans turned non-performing, the question is what would happen to those loans? We assume that there will be higher rate of non-performing loan trading. So if a bank, for example, has as a commercial lending team um, loans in their books, then do they then need to sell those loans to their trading desk to prove that um, there is still a value in it because then the market has proven that there is value in, in that loan and then they don't need to provision and then we only have 
all those loans with the trading entities and not the commercial banks anymore who are supposed to support the economy, private households and corporates? Well, uh, I don't think uh, it goes, uh, it's needed to go that far. We have a wonderful uh, situation being uh, the supervisors of 19 countries to have a good knowledge on a good benchmark of the situation on the good appreciations, and I'm sure uh, my colleagues will demonstrate because their, their database is, is incredible, uh, uh, incredibly uh, comprehensive and precise, so no need to go to the market to have a price that could be negotiated with another counterparty, as a matter of fact. That would not be enough to have uh, uh, such a limited number of transactions. Uh, we have better, better information. Uh, you, 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 your question seems to suggest as well that uh, uh, to take care of uh, non-performing exposures uh, uh, is eating uh, financial uh, stability at the end of the day because uh, less loans uh, on the less growth maybe uh, we what is uh, we cannot ignore risk uh, uh, if risks are not addressed uh, they are not uh, disappearing they are just getting uh, bigger so we need to address risk. We need to address risk early enough when the, 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 the piling up uh, of non-performing exposures uh, is taking place. Uh, that will learn probably, uh, that will demonstrate to the banks that maybe uh, there is something wrong with their uh, underwriting uh, credit criteria. Uh, if they are starting to uh, pile up uh, necessary provisions for non-performing exposures, uh, and it's better that they know it sooner than, than later to be able to uh, correct the trajectory. Uh, and uh, as the president, I said, I will remind you that banks that are burdened because precisely they do not address the non-performing exposures at the, the beginning, uh, burdened with non-performing exposure stocks, uh, are the ones that constantly and consistently lend less to the economy. So uh, I guess there is no other solution than to uh, have a good knowledge of the situation, thanks to the supervisory dialogue on the need to make the provisions when the new non-performing exposures are uh, starting, to take the needed measures to uh, correct the, the, this trend uh, and address the, the, the problem uh, of the, the stock when there is a stock uh, fast enough to be able to do their job and really lend to the economy, not uh, uh, spending their uh, human resources uh, to uh, get solutions for non-performing exposures instead of uh, unchanging their, their business model when it is needed or finalizing, uh, uh, fine-tuning their business model rather than put all their energy uh, to address a, a big stock. But you, you have, uh, no, uh, can mention what you have in your databases maybe oh, to, yeah. uh, to, to avoid the, the need to practically get a price. <laughs> So we have obviously regulatory reporting, but um, we also have in implemented a series of enhanced reporting uh, for banks with um, higher levels of MPLs. Um, we also engage quite regularly with banks on management data. We engage with accountants also and um, statutory auditors um, on the level of transactions. We would monitor this on a quarterly basis. So if we were to see movements um, that maybe warranted us to focus on with a higher level of risk, a higher level of attention, this would absolutely be in our remit. This would be something the JSTs would deal with on a quarterly basis, really assessing the data, the level of granularity, um, mismatching, mismatches, etc. So this is definitely within our focus and something, again, um, that we will continue to monitor when the guidance um, is implemented so that we can ensure no arbitrage, for example, or unintended consequences, etc. So absolutely in our radar. Thank you. Um, I think there were some questions over here on, on the side of the room. Yeah. So the gentleman here 
or, or the, you start with, and then can you, yes, please hand over then the microphone to the gentleman. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Uh, Francesca Brunari from Confindustria. Confindustria is the Italian association representing 150,000 manufacturing and service companies employing around 5.4 million people. So just a few comments on business side. Businesses are concerned about the impact on the, of the addendum on credit supply to enterprises and particularly to SMEs, uh, which still rely heavily on bank lending. In this context, we are still particularly worried about the impact of the addendum on unsecured loans, which of course are very important to us. Um, of course, we acknowledge the importance to keep reducing NPL ratio and uh, the stock of NPL. This is particularly important uh, for uh, Italian enterprises. But we, be, we believe that this has to be done gradually. We share these concerns with Business Europe, which is the European association representing association of industrial companies from all over Europe. Business Europe sent uh, a letter to Madame Nui early this week uh, answering the consultation. Together with Business Europe, we fear that the release of the addendum at the beginning of the recovery phase, which is very important to us, uh, could represent a restrictive measure penalizing economic growth across Europe. Uh, we do not agree with the argument that the addendum would impact only on specific countries or specific banks. On the contrary, we believe that due to an unavoidable contagion effect in the EU, uh, measures like uh, the addendum could penalize the European banking sector as a whole and the European economy as a whole, increasing systemic risk and not reducing systemic risk. This is why we believe that before finalizing new rules, it is essential to carry out an impact assessment of these rules uh, on enterprises in order to ensure that they encourage growth and prevent damage to businesses in the wider economy. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Because you represent the corporates, I would like to make a remark on the, for the corporates as well on then and hand over to my colleagues. Uh, in fact, when uh, non-performing exposures are addressed early enough, uh, it's uh, much more likely that they will be able, uh, those exposures, those loans, to be queued, to be restructured uh, and transformed into uh, a performing loan. Uh, and uh, that's important for the corporates because if this is not uh, happening, uh, what is a non-performing loan in the balance sheet of the bank is uh, something that is also in the balance sheet of the corporates. And uh, until uh, this is uh, fixed with the, the other lender way or another, uh, the, the good banks, the banks that are not burdened by non-performing exposures and that uh, are making more loans than the others, uh, they will not make loans to uh, corporate which uh, has a uh, long uh, uh, number of elements in the balance sheet that are just uh, disputes with the banks, uh, loans that are not uh, performing, uh, well, borrow, uh, borrowing for, for the, the corporates that are not performing. So uh, we should not uh, think only about uh, sales uh, or write-off or uh, also the write-offs would help the, the, the corporates. But when it's done early enough, really, the, 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 the way of addressing it is uh, much more easy and much less painful. Q, restructure the loan, make it performing by having uh, longer maturity, maybe uh, by uh, uh, structuring it uh, differently. Uh, and it's not in, uh, a benefit uh, for the, the, the corporates to have these uh, non-performing loans uh, not, not at risk. It's even a double punishment, in fact, for the, the, the growth uh, on the economy of the country. Yeah, I would only compliment that. Um, I think the point about addressing earlier being better um, is absolutely the case. Unfortunately, uh, many countries and many of our supervisors have had bad experiences over the last uh, few years uh, with non-performing loans and the negative effect that they can have. Our qualitative guidance uh, for the stock, when we, we uh, prepared that, uh, a lot of the work there was looking at best practices in banks and in other supervisors prior to the introduction of banking union. And certainly one of the key issues there was that addressing uh, problems earlier and putting in place proper restructures. Uh, so not uh, what we used to call uh, extend and pretend, but proper restructures that are actually effective um, is better. And so I, I would just uh, add that to, to uh, what has already been said. I, I think the other aspect is 
Um, of course, in introducing something for new loans, we have to think about how that will interact with credit. Uh, but I think it's our responsibility to make sure that non-performing loans do not emerge as another problem into the future. And that is a key motivation in this case, is to protect uh, banks and economies and households and firms uh, from a, a build-up in the future, because we can see now the scale of the problem that we have with the, the pile of non-performing loans that we still have from the previous crisis. So the gentleman who has the microphone, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, Ignaz Bicula from uh, Italian Federation of Cooperative Banks. Uh, I have three questions uh, to put on the table. The first one, uh, don't you think that uh, an extent uh, and general obligation for provisioning set at 100% denies the risk taking and risk management core nature of the banking uh, business? Uh, this is the, the first question. The second one, uh, I would like to, to come back to the macroeconomic effect. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, uh, a growing economy as we have at the moment is a, a good environment for balance sheet cleaning and to reduce uh, significantly the stock uh, of uh, NPLs. However, what will happen during a downturn cycle? Uh, how to overcome the likely procyclicality effect uh, in uh, an economic recession? Uh, did the ECB carry out an impact assessment? If so, what are the results? The third question, uh, what do you think about uh, implicit incentives given to market participants for uh, non-performing loans? Uh, in my opinion, those incentives are not the right one because as non-performing loans buyers know that banks are obliged to sell their non-performing loans portfolio within a binding deadline, buyers know that they have the upper hand on price setting. Thank you. Well, I, I will start uh, on in particular with uh, your last uh, questions, uh, incentives. Uh, I don't know, but I think uh, an important incentive that uh, is for banks that doing too little too late can uh, take them to fail uh, or can take the SSM to take a decision of failing or likely to fail. This has happened recently to uh, a few banks. Uh, and that's triggered by investors that uh, are losing trust in, in the banks and stop uh, funding them uh, at a certain moment because they consider too little, too late is done. So it's a very serious issue that banks have to take uh, seriously. Uh, that's uh, the, the, the first point. Uh, regarding the, well, I, I've not noted very well your, your first question, so I will end over immediately and I will come back if something, uh, if there was something I wanted to say. I also start with this uh, question about incentives. Uh, first to say there is no uh, obligation arising from uh, either the original guidance or for the addendum for banks to sell portfolios of non-performing loans. I think we have been consistently clear in relation to this in all the communications we have made uh, about both the original guidance and this addendum. Them. Clearly, sales of non-performing loans is a tool that banks can use um, as part of their suite of measures. Uh, but we have not imposed any requirements on banks to do that. And as part of the strategies and the dialogue uh, that continues with the banks, of course, some banks may decide to do that, uh, but we haven't set any expectations in that regard. So I think uh, you, you said, uh, I think, obliged. And it's important to clarify that because um, we, we haven't uh, put an obligation like that uh, in place. In terms of your broader questions, again, about the economy and so on, and uh, the backdrop of a growing economy being a good opportunity to clean balance sheets uh, and a concern about pro-cyclicality. Um, I think, of course, we have to take all of these things into account, but I think our view is if you don't deal with these issues in a time of growth, 
uh, then what happens if there is a downturn in the future and there is a still a significant problem or a growing problem at that time? Um, and so uh, for us, it's a balance of uh, what is the right and prudent measure uh, to do, particularly in this case where we're talking about new loans uh, to prevent a build-up of uh, non-performing loans into the future. And then if I understood your first question well about the 100% effectively putting a, a kind of obligation on the bank that denies its ability to, to do what it's there to do, which is to take risk and make loans, um, I think, uh, and I certainly hope we've been very clear today, uh, that this is not a kind of a binding approach. We are setting it out in a clear way that this is what we expect. I think it's reasonable as a supervisor to say, if uh, this hasn't been dealt with after two years or seven years, what is going on here? Why has this not been dealt with? Why has it not been provisioned? Uh, and we are setting that out as a starting point in terms of our expectations for the di dialogue to take place. I think it doesn't mean that there's a general obligation on a bank to, to do something. Uh, that means it, it can't uh, take on loans and do its, its work in terms of managing risk and so on. Yes, I have found the two points that I wanted to add. Uh, it was mentioned several times that we have not uh, reacted. Why not impact assessment? Well, we are talking about new uh, non-performing exposures. Uh, so it's a bit uh, complicated to have uh, an assessment uh, of something that does not exist. Uh, we, we can uh, use uh, different elements to try to, 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 to guess what the situation will be. But we can do an, easily an impact assessment for everything uh, related to the stock, but it's pretty difficult. And we believe that uh, due to this new framework that uh, uh, ensures that credit risk is taken more seriously, uh, credit underwriting criteria uh, will be uh, reviewed and improved in the bank. There, will, there should be less uh, new non-performing exposures after the, the, the guidance and after all the work uh, on the supervisory dialogue which is taking uh, place right now uh, for, for, for the banks uh, that uh, have to, to address uh, their problem. Uh, regarding also the, 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 the automatic uh, element, on the, there was uh, directly or indirectly a relation to the, uh, the, 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 the fact that we disregard the value of the collateral, for example, uh, for the, uh, the secured loans. Uh, we don't question at all the, the value of the collateral, but we question the timely executability of the collateral, the recoverability of the collateral, because if it cannot be uh, repossessed and used and executed in such a fashion that it is uh, uh, covering the, the, the non-performing exposure, what is the benefit of having uh, such collateral? Uh, and after such a period of time, the probability that something will be recovered from the collateral is much, much uh, lower. Uh, so, well, yes, uh, collateral is a credit risk mitigant, but uh, once a loan uh, becomes uh, non-performing, uh, seven years to take care of the executability of the collateral is something uh, already uh, quite, uh, I would say, maybe not generous, but reasonable at least. Thank you. Um, another question or comment from the front here, please. Um, thank you very much. Jacqueline Mills from the Association for Financial Markets uh, in Europe again. Um, I think two quick observations and then a question, if I may. Um, it seems that in the uh, debate on NPLs and how to deal with them, one um, aspect that perhaps requires further attention, research, consideration is precisely the role that collateral does play. I think it's not always about um, its execution. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be executed or realized to um, help restructuring um, and successful outcomes. Um, and I think that that also might be at the root um, of some, uh, some of the industry's nervous, nervousness about some of these proposals. Um, a second comment. Um, there was an association representing financial markets. Um, I think what I, we would like to say in terms of uh, the development of secondary markets for NPLs, of course, that is very important as being one of the solutions um, that has been mentioned. I 
think, and we would, en you know, we would encourage the ECB, but also all of the other institutions who are involved in uh, these discussions, to ensure that there are no distortions that are created as an unintended side effect in the market. So making sure that there is an appropriate balance between the supply and the demand side is um, very important. And I'm not quite sure, but I, I, I hope that um, Sharon Finn's team uh, would be looking at possible um, unintended consequences or possible distortions that could arise um, in that context. Um, my, my question um, relates again to, a little bit to, uh, to secondary markets and NPL purchases and trading. Um, I was a little bit concerned about the response to an earlier question um, on how to deal with uh, the, uh, the purchase of, of NPLs and whether the calendar provisioning expectation would apply in that case. Um, it, it occurs to me that perhaps a purchase of NPLs should not perhaps not be considered as uh, falling under the new NPL or new NPE category. Um, I, I think it might be interesting to explore that. Um, because while you do explain that there could be a case here to deviate from the supervisory expectation, depending on, on the dialogue that you would have with your supervisor, it seems to me that that could be a relatively burden, burdensome process for some banks to have to go through uh, to achieve that um, explanation um, and uh, acceptance from their JST. Whereas other market participants who are not subject to these provisioning rules uh, would not have that burden. And I wonder if there might not be, again, a little bit of a, again, perhaps an unintended distortion uh, in the secondary markets here. Thank you. Well, this question was uh, responded by uh, my uh, yeah. right side, so I will let them. Two remarks on, dot, on your two uh, first points that uh, are kind of follow up to what I said before. The, the, the role uh, of collateral and uh, what we expect from collateral, uh, well, that could be uh, improved, in fact, uh, and uh, will make uh, the, the recoverability of collateral uh, uh, more easy. Uh, when we, re we look at what the, the banks sometimes uh, call secured loans, uh, they, 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 in good faith, believe that they have secured loans. But uh, uh, sometimes uh, they have, in fact, uh, a promise to give collateral that was given uh, when the, the, the loan was uh, allocated, was, was uh, granted. Uh, but uh, the maintenance of this uh, situation, the legal documentation that could have uh, been uh, taken at a certain moment was absolutely was not perfect, uh, and uh, well, uh, what is supposed to be secured of a, all of a second is not secured, uh, in fact, because the, the legal documentation is not uh, properly uh, done or, or maintained. Uh, and on top of that, uh, when it's possible, uh, when the legal documentation is correct indeed, uh, uh, there are still too many uh, uncertainties regarding the, the capacity of the judicial systems to, to permit this, uh, this reposition. Uh, also, uh, regarding the secondary markets for NPLs, you said uh, uh, something uh, around the, the, the balance between supply and demand that uh, has to be taken into account. Well, we, we have uh, 800 billion of non-performing exposures uh, in the SSM bank. It's not a market for the buyer, for the sellers. It will always be a market for the buyer until uh, we are much, 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 much lower uh, in the amounts. Uh, so in these circumstances, uh, I would say better be among the first uh, to, to use the, the markets because uh, after a certain moment, well, maybe uh, th th there will be uh, no, no buyer anymore. We don't know, but uh, it cannot, the, cannot be a balance when you have so much uh, to, to, to sell, uh, really. Maybe just on the burdensome process. So first of all, I mean, we're here to hear the feedback, so thank you for that, and we will certainly take it into account. Maybe just one observation. Even if you leave aside the addendum, OK, um, if you're a bank and you're buying a portfolio of non-performing loans, uh, I think it's fair to say your supervisor is going to want to know a lot about that anyway, in terms of understanding why you're doing that, how you're going to manage that, what the recovery is going to be like on that and so on. So I, I think the point we were making was 
as part of the due diligence process a bank would be doing anyway to buy a portfolio of non-performing loans, there would be a discussion with the supervisor to understand. Um, and then part of that now uh, with the addendum would also be to take that into account. But I, I think you can expect that there would be some discussions and information to be provided anyway. But nonetheless, we, we will take away uh, your comments. I don't know if you want to add something, Sharon. Um, yeah, so absolutely, because as part of the process to buy them, there is almost a right sizing of the value also. So we'd have to take that into consideration. So um, the value is coming down, coming off the balance sheet of the, the bank that's selling is going on to the balance sheet of the bank that's buying. But as part of that transaction, and as Sharon pointed out, the due diligence process, there is a in-depth loan by loan file assessment of the inherent value, the valuation of collateral. So there will be a right sizing. There will be a certain um, fixing the problem, should you say, in terms of, you know, the estimated recoveries, etc. So absolutely taken on board. And more and more JSTs are engaging with banks on these particular types of um, transactions. And as we move through the work on the strategies, we are receiving numerous different types of proposals similar to these, where we are looking at them in a horizontal fashion to make sure there is consistency and that the data supports the assumptions, etc. So very much part of the process. Thank you. There's another question over there, please. Thank you. Charles from uh, Barbers Asset Management. I have a question. Um, could you consider a general LGD waiver on NPL sales for a specific period of time in order to incentivize banks to accelerate the sale of NPL? I'm not quite sure what you call LGD waiver. You mean that we disregard the, the very low price uh, in the LGD that will be used for the models? Uh, well, uh, we uh, we are obliged to uh, to implement uh, the legislative text, uh, what the legislators uh, wanted, uh, CRD4, uh, CRR. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, being uh, the uh, uh, former Secretary General of the Basel Committee at the moment when we drafted this regulation about uh, models, I know what we had in mind and what I drafted also in, uh, in Basel. And I am supported with my colleague Stéphane Walter, also former Secretary General of the Basel Committee, that knows uh, what we have in mind. In fact, uh, you are correct, there is a small margin for specific uh, situations that uh, permit uh, to uh, be a little bit uh, flexible on the consequences uh, of very uh, low prices uh, that could uh, damage uh, the, the LGD. But there are conditions for that. Uh, normally, it has to be done for uh, the, the sale of a comprehensive portfolio, the total portfolio, meaning that the portfolio that would have deserved uh, this uh, damaging LGD is gone uh, totally. So uh, no reason to, uh, uh, to have uh, some kind of tainting of the, the other LGDs. Uh, if it's not the case, not totally gone, uh, we have uh, to have a supervisory dialogue here as well with the bank, explaining uh, why uh, all thought uh, apparently it's not the total portfolio which has been sold. What is remaining is not uh, the same, does not present the same characteristics as the, the portfolio that has been uh, sold. Uh, with low prices. And it can be the case, for example, we have situations where banks have uh, different uh, vintages and different origins of the, the, the sub-portfolios. Uh, a bank that, has, uh, that is the, the result of mergers that took place before. Uh, if the bank can uh, demonstrate that, oh, this is coming from uh, the former bank A, and this bank A was much worse than the two others with whom, uh, with which it, it was merged, then uh, you, you have a good case, dear supervisor, to take into account uh, a difference. Uh, so there is a, a possibility. Uh, the, the margin is narrow, pretty narrow. So uh, we would not take the risk of not uh, implementing properly the legislation for, uh, I would say, a small operation. 
if uh, a bank comes uh, with good reasoning for uh, this LGD issue, and on top of that is uh, ready to do a very serious one-off cleaning, that then the bank gets the attention of the supervisor. This is what I can tell you uh, on this. Any other comments, questions? Over here, please. Uh, Thomas Demian from BNP Paribas. Uh, I'd like to come back to one of, of your previous comments. You were saying that risks have to be addressed early so that they, they disappear. However, by, by incentivizing banks, notably the weakest ones, to sell their NPLs to less regulated, not to say unregulated investors, mainly non-new in, uh, entities, aren't you pushing NPL risks out of your supervisory scope only? And therefore expose SMEs and households to much more aggressive collateral recoveries. Banks build long-term relationship with their clients when third parties will be probably more interested in short-term profits. Well, I, I will start by saying that uh, as this is about uh, new non-performing uh, loans, uh, that's not uh, totally the, the situation that you describe. Uh, the situation that you describe is more related to the, the existing uh, stock uh, for which uh, we can see uh, uh, sales. But we, um, we take for the legacy, precisely, precisely the stock, we take the, the bank's own plans. Uh, on which challenge them to make them uh, credible and on, on ambitious enough. But we start with the uh, bank's uh, own plans. And we, we have seen, uh, so we recommend nothing. The, the, the banks is deciding about the, the solution. Supervisors should not manage the bank or manage their, their, their problems. Uh, just uh, make sure that the banks address the, 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 the problems. In, a, in certain countries where the, the levels of uh, non-performing exposures are uh, pretty high, uh, we can see uh, what we call in our jargon uh, strategic defaulters, meaning uh, a number of uh, customers that uh, could pay uh, but uh, do not reimburse their credits because uh, that's the average situation in the country. You don't reimburse the credit until you are totally forced to, to do that, and hopefully will not happen anytime soon. Um, so yes, the, the, they are probably the first uh, customers to target, but that's the job of the banks to identify, and in general, they know them very well. Uh, what are these uh, strategic defaulters that we would like to see address uh, uh, among, the, among the first? I would just add again, um, I, I don't think we have made any obligation on banks to sell portfolios. We recognise that this is uh, one of the tools uh, that they use. Um, and while not within uh, our competence, I know that in some of the countries, because we saw this in our stock take of national practices and so on, uh, some countries have put in place uh, frameworks to protect the borrowers, particularly if they're personal borrowers, if their loans are sold on. Yes, here in this... Uh the gentleman here in the middle. Uh, thank you. Federico Cornelli, Italian Banking Association. Uh, just to, to uh, understand, you, you gave uh, an answer um, regarding the massive disposal of MPLs. Uh, imagine uh, we are in the process of having the proposal from the Parliament for the new CRR, and we are hope that the Article 181 of CRR might have a, a change allowing for uh, uh, the, the correct computation of LGDs in case of massive disposal. I mean, would you be in favor of such an uh, opportunity, of course, under the control of the SSM or the national competent authorities, because this will allow us to uh, accelerate the disposal of, of NPLs, uh, avoiding the second impact of the um, um, disposals. And uh, the first and the second question is, when we sell MPL, we normally have in front of us two kind of buyers. The first one is a, a non-bank, for example, a fund. And the second one is a bank under CRR and all the other rule, having a banking license. Uh, if uh, the question is, uh, would you apply the addendum 
to the bank, to the potential buyer, uh, again, even if this, for example, has a vintage already of five, uh, because this is very important to avoid, again, an unintended distortion of the number of potential buyers, as we have been able in Italy to attract a vast number of buyers and prices have soared from average 18 to average 32. It is of uh, common, common interest to maintain the, the largest number possible. This could be two solutions. Thanks. I, I will start with the LGD uh, issue of, with my uh, past experience, long past experience with models. No, I don't agree with what you are proposing and you call it correct computation of uh, uh, LGDs when massive sale. It's not correct computation of LGD. This is the real LGD. When you sell uh, non-performing loans, you are realizing your real true LGD. It's as simple as that. So uh, no, I am not in favor of that. Uh, if we do that, uh, we kill the credibility of models of European banks vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other colleagues in other regions of the world. They had already expressed uh, doubts uh, about uh, uh, the, the, the risk-weighted asset variability of models in certain uh, occasions. We are uh, spending a lot of resources to revalidate the, the models of the SSM banks to make sure they are uh, well uh, built, these models, well maintained, and that deliver adequate uh, risk-weighted uh, assets. Uh, so uh, we will certainly not uh, play games with uh, LGDs. That's not at all uh, a possibility. We want the, the, the parameters of the models to be, uh, uh, to be so sound, safe. Uh, and uh, we cannot uh, ignore uh, risk uh, by having a reality which uh, uh, looks uh, nicer than what it is. Uh, and uh, it's also a matter of level playing field. A number of uh, banks uh, in the SSM uh, countries uh, are uh, selling uh, non-expected, uh, well, non-performing exposures and take the LGD consequences and have been taking the LGD consequences for decades. Uh, so uh, that will be uh, really a very uh, bad move, in my view, for the credibility of the, the models that we are uh, uh, creating by our, our, our twin project. This being said, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, for very specific circumstances, there is a little bit of margin. Margin is thin, which is left to the appreciation of the supervisors. And frankly, with all the work uh, on efforts we have put uh, in uh, trying to address uh, and fix this non-performing exposure issue, again, uh, a banker which is uh, willing to do the, the right thing, taking uh, the, the right measures uh, and can uh, give us good reasons to, uh, to, to, to use the possible flexibility on LGD, uh, get, will get our attention. We will not start uh, by being negative and saying no except if. We will say, OK, let's look at what you have to offer. And we know also that when we do that, we create a precedent because uh, uh, this, another bank exactly in the same situation will need to have the, the same treatment. So we will be cautious but open-minded, provided we are still uh, complying with the rules, which are the rules. Uh, and supervisors are there to get the rules uh, implemented. But indeed, there is a small merger, a small margin seen margin for flexibility. But uh, again, uh, we uh, want to see, uh, you use the word massive. Yes, massive operation of cleaning uh, would get our attention. I think your second question was complementary to the question or the discussion we were having earlier also. Uh, so first I would say, <clears throat> in terms of definition, as we had said earlier, the definitions are consistent with the EBA definition. So to set the vintage count back to zero or to say that a loan has been cured and so on obviously requires it to meet the criteria that have been set out in the definition and all of our guidance and so on is consistent with that uh, important work that has been done to standardise. Um, 
I think, as we said earlier, if a, a bank is selling a portfolio to another bank, then clearly there's a process that, that's gone through, regardless of the addendum, in terms of supervisory dialogue and also the due diligence process and so on, um, which would be part of the discussion. Um, but we will, uh, I think, consider the feedback in terms of how maybe we can explain this a, a little bit better in the, in the addendum. Yes, the gentleman in the back, here, please. Hi, this is, this is Manuel from Santander. If I, I wanted to know if you could elaborate a little more on the linear path to this 100% that you are mentioning precisely because of the models and, and to, to know your opinion in, in this linear path could not jeopardize the credibility of the models. We've been working in models reacting to the vintage of MPLs for a while, so uh, I wanted to know your opinion on that. Thank you. Mm. So first of all about the linear path, I think the reason why we put it there uh, was to try to mitigate against a kind of cliff edge effect where nothing would happen um, and then at the last moment there would be a large provision to be taken. So we were trying to set out uh, that, that we expected banks to be able to do this gradually and, and this would be a way that we would think about it. Um, I think it's important to emphasise as well though that if the bank is taking more provisions than that itself through its own policies and procedures, uh, then obviously that's also the case as well and we would be uh, discussing that with the bank. Um, I think then, then in terms of LGD, it would be about the, the dialogue with the bank and, and how those things actually work out, whether they have their own policies, whether they're taking a linear path or whether they're doing something else. Maybe you want to add something? No, I, I think the point is right that when we put in a suitable gradual path, um, we wanted to keep it quite open, which for the two years makes sense. I think there it's, it's good to keep it open and to give banks the time to, to consider themselves what's, what's adequate. But when we came to the seven years, we had a lot of discussion with our different supervisors in the 19 countries. And there were concerns if we left it completely open and said just suitable gradual path, it could result in an unlevel playing field. So this is why in the end we decided to put some high level guidance. Now, if there are ideas in the consultation phase where you say we actually have a better idea of how to specify this, um, which we consider a bit, bit better approach, we'd be very happy to, to listen. Any uh, other questions or comments? Yes, please, in the back there. Yes, hello, my name is Nicholas Comfort. I'm a journalist with Bloomberg News. I realize it's not a press conference, but since we're at the end of the hearing, I would like to ask one question, please. Um, my question is um, about the, a potential delay to the, um, to the implementation of, uh, of the guidelines. Madame Nui, you were very clear, very clear in Brussels it, at the Econ hearing that you will take on, you will listen to all the feedback, you will process it, and if that means you can't get something together for the first, or if it means you can't finalize your, your package for the 1st of January, you will take more time to, um, to, to, to finalize it. My, so my, my question is, is how much time do you think you have? Is this something which needs to be done in, in 2018? I mean, 2018 is a long period. And then even if you can't tell us exactly the, the kind of the timeline on that, maybe you can tell us about the, the, the periods of time that matter for this, because I, I sit on the other side, I, I look at bank releases and quarterly reports, and they are quarterly. Uh, and I wonder how, how that figures into to, to any, any potential delay, and whether we should be expecting something which should be a month-by-month -month delay or a, um, a quarterly delay. Thank you. Well, to be honest, I cannot be more precise than that I have been in the European Parliament because we don't know yet uh, how many comments and how complex the comments uh, will be. As a matter of fact, uh, it was just common sense, so we did it. Uh, before the, this hearing, uh, we uh, asked our colleagues how many comments we have already received and what are the, the points that we should be ready to address in this hearing, because those are points of concern. On the single end, uh, was enough to count the comments that we have already received. So I presume that we will receive a lot because this is an issue that uh, raise, uh, raises a lot uh, of interest. But uh, I don't know how many. I don't know how complex they will be. Uh, 
uh, we have received already, it's not comments, but uh, uh, a number of uh, legal consultations uh, the, 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 the Parliament in particular. Uh, we will certainly take uh, into account all the good legal advice that we have received to make sure that uh, the addendum is drafted uh, as uh, cautiously uh, as possible and translates uh, the reality and not uh, does not look like uh, pillar one. Uh, for the rest, we don't know. So what we will do is that uh, once uh, the, the deadline is uh, uh, happens, uh, it's 8 December, if I remember well, we will see where we are. And uh, we know that it may take uh, two or three more days uh, to see uh, the, the, the total, because a few will uh, come also maybe the day after. Uh, and then we will assess the, the, the quantity of work it takes to uh, do what we always do through consultation. We take consultations very, very seriously. Uh, we, we publish the comments. We explain why uh, we are taking comments, certain comments, and not, not others. So uh, based on the, the, the time uh, it takes to do a good job in uh, drafting the final addendum on uh, explaining, well, uh, going through the comments, uh, take the, the the ones that we should take and explain why we are not taking, taking certain of them, uh, we will see what it means. Uh, because uh, if we look from a different perspective, uh, what is desirable? The desirable is very uh, obvious. The sooner, the better, obviously, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we address the, 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 the future uh, possible piling up of non-performing exposures. Uh, but uh, it will take what it will take. It's a, it's a big uh, issue. Uh, we started in 2014, so a couple of additional months would not be uh, uh, an issue. Uh, and uh, I was indeed uh, clear in um, in Brussels because I explained to uh, the, the, the people that were in the hearing, the members of the parliament that were in the hearings, that I was taken note of what they were telling to me, but uh, that would be uh, the final uh, decision, the, the supervisory board of the SSM that will uh, take it. Uh, but I said for, for this one, the timing precisely, uh, I will recommend, I went as far as saying, I will recommend to my supervisory board members to, to postpone a little bit to make sure, if need be, to make sure that we can make full use uh, of the comments. Because uh, indeed, uh, well, uh, the, 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 the timeline is, uh, is uh, very tight on the probably too tight uh, uh, to uh, even in spending a lot of time in the offices between Christmas and New Year's Eve, that will be a little bit delicate. So uh, a few additional months are probably needed. But I cannot tell more because I don't know at all what we should expect. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've just been uh, very close to running out of time, um, so let me close here. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, as we said, the, the site, the website is still open for comments until December 8th, midnight. Thank you very much. <laughs>